Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are joining us from today. Faced with serious challenges, governments really must innovate. To do that, they have to draw on the talent of their entire workforce. They have to address the barriers within and across departments and adapt civil servants' tools, incentives and systems. Adopting a format as innovative as the subject matter, Global Government Forum's Innovation 2020 in support with our knowledge partners EY, Google Cloud, Workday and Huawei, will bring together all of you, civil servants from around the globe, to explore this crucial field of government transformation. So a big welcome from me to Innovation 2020. I'm Siobhan Bonita, I'm a former UK civil servant, and I'll be helping to steer us all through the next two days. In a short while, we'll say a little bit more about how the programme will develop over the next two days. But because time is tight for our first speaker, I'm going to straight away introduce Alex Chisholm. So Alex is the UK Civil Services Chief Operating Officer and Permanent Secretary to the Cabinet Office. And he also leads the Civil Service Efficiency and Reform Programme. So there really is no better civil servant to kick us off today and talk about innovation in the civil service. Alex, straight over to you. Thanks, Siobhan. Uh, good morning, everybody. At least a morning here in London, and I'll be uh, having a cup of coffee here to get us underway in London and wherever you are around the world. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, great to be meeting uh, together in this online meeting. Very, uh, very appropriate indeed, given the times we're in that we are uh, having a virtual meeting. Um, and, you know, like so much else that um, has happened this year, it now seems quite normal to be doing so. But of course, you know, even seven or eight months ago, um, we didn't actually have meetings like this as a matter of course several times a day, so it is a big change in a short period of time. And it's an example, I think, of how the pandemic has jolted us into finding very innovative ways to live and work, and for us uh, in government, injecting fresh urgency into addressing perhaps familiar challenges. COVID has accelerated our thinking about doing things differently and better, particularly how we look after citizens and deploy data to this mission. And data has been absolutely key to analyzing the virus, forecasting its trajectory, identifying those infected who need to quarantine themselves, uh, starting today in the UK with the Prime Minister, uh, not because he's infected himself, but because he had contact with somebody who had been infected, shielding the especially vulnerable in uh, developing new testing new treatments and new vaccines. All of that has been absolutely dependent on data. And it shows, I think, how data has a huge role to play in the innovation we want to see across all government services. We're very keen, as we revamp our own services, to learn from the examples of other countries. And that's part, I think, of the value that Global Government Forum brings. We're keen to learn from best-in-class capabilities of Singapore have been very successful, I think, in, in dealing with the virus uh, and in other aspects of government. Uh, and I know GGF audiences heard about these at a recent webinar on civil service transformers. Also the innovations of Israel, the cross-government skills of Canada, the uh, success of New Zealand in dealing with the virus and also their cross-government delivery method. And of course, the US, Germany, China have all made huge strides as we've uh, at a global level, try to deal with um, this terrific virus. And while we can all agree that data is a powerful engine of growth that will drive global economic recovery, we also need to recognize that it comes with huge responsibilities. We must use it in a way that reflects and merits the trust placed in us by citizens and reflecting the enduring values of transparency and accountability. Now, you might be thinking, those of you who are not in the UK, gosh, the UK has got quite a lot on its plate at the moment. You know, we've got uh, not only COVID, but also the final stages of our departure from the EU, the climate emergency, which affects all of us around the world, some of the economic challenges we're going to face, partly because of the response to COVID. Is this really the time to be pushing for a major government reform? To which we say, yes, COVID has crystallized the need for innovation and reform. It's given us fresh impetus to ensure that colleagues have better digital skills, that more government services are digital by default, and that we tackle the burden of costly, cumbersome legacy IT 
that stops us from realizing the full benefits of sharing data. Our goal is to provide the kind of personalized, seamless digital service that people expect by default from their supermarket or their bank and reasonably should be able to expect from the government. Other nations have tackled the same issue. It used to be the case in Singapore that, quote, citizens were expected to be like the planets revolving around us as the sun, in the words of their senior public servant, Tia Sin Wun, in the GGS September webinar. Public services were organized into agencies, agencies, she said, with citizens forced to travel from one agency to another to get anything done in a ceaseless orbit seemingly without end. No longer, Singapore's agencies now work together to wrap services around citizens, digitizing services and making sure that services related to particularly important life stages such as birth and bereavement are accessed via a single shared platform. Now, of course, the UK and Singapore are starting from different places, physically, culturally, geographically, historically. But as with Singapore, we too believe we owe real change to the people we serve to make sure the machinery of government is equal to the task of meeting future needs, to make sure we are the model of a modern, fully digitally enabled service provider. As Michael Gove, the UK's Minister of the Cabinet Office, said in his Ditchy Lecture on Reform this summer, at the heart of our efforts must be a focus on what works, what actually helps our fellow citizens to flourish. Today I hope to give you a sense of our direction of travel. Starting with our habits during the pandemic, it's striking how people's digital needs abruptly changed. We've always been keen netizens in the UK, but during the spring lockdown, we were throwing out digital lifelines as never before, relying on internet and data services to inform and empower us even when stuck at home. Ofcom data shows that in April, our internet use reached an all-time high. Adults in the UK were online for an average four hours a day to stay connected, informed, and entertained, doing business and living our lives. And for many, of course, seeking urgent financial support from the government. The unprecedented explosion in demand for digital and online services put government infrastructure to the test as never before. Some things worked really well, other things less so. On the upside, I'm particularly proud of the impressive turn of pace we showed to scale up existing services and build new digital products. Dare I say, even occasionally surprising ourselves. At eight o'clock in the morning on April 20th, for instance, a Monday morning like today, HM Revenue Commissioners hastily created a website for the coronavirus furlough scheme went live. In the next 30 minutes, it received 67,000 applications. Each one of those a real lifeline for the household uh, making that application. This was a project remarkable for having been built largely in the spare rooms on the kitchen tables from the goodwill of civil servants working, working away all hours at home. Importantly, Mark Denny, HMRC's then digital and information officer, took an agile blended approach that saw technical architects and consultants work hand in hand with policy advisors. And thanks to their efforts, the website stood up to this unprecedented demand for many millions of workers with virtually no technical or scaling issues. This was an admirable effort, and so too was the government's vulnerable person service, which was built in just four days and has helped hundreds of thousands of worried, exposed citizens. And the Department of Work and Pensions, which for years has been developing universal credit, the digital version, of the, the digital qualities of universal credit really came to the fore um, in, the, in this crisis. Um, with um, um, five weeks after the UK went into spring, spring uh, lockdown, there had been more than 1.8 million new claims to universal credit, almost a million of them in the first fortnight. Now, with the huge increase in demand for those services, clearly that came with a lot of difficulties for, for um, providing continuous service. In fact, the DWP received 2.2 uh, million calls in a single day. So that gives you um, an idea of the volume of demand for the services. But the website, it did slow at various points, but didn't fall over. And in that sense, the tsunami was withstood, and 93% of the claims processed um, successfully in the first week of lockdown were paid out in full on time. And that's just some of the new services we had to stand. It also put terrific pressure, the virus, on some of the, uh, and the demand it created on some of the existing services. Gov.uk had a record 132 million page views. 
compared to a 2020 weekly average of uh, around about 48 million before the pandemic. And that figure relates to users who consent to analytics tracking, so the real number is likely to be much higher. It's almost impossible to imagine how we could have coped with this public hunger for information without having gov.uk as a hugely reliable service that people are able to depend on. Nearly a million new gov.uk verify accounts were created in the three months from March, establishing people's uh, online identities, and giving people access to critical on, uh, online services like universal credit. Peak levels in March saw over 193,000 users sign up in a week. Again, many times um, more than the average number previously, about was a, around about a five-fold increase. It's clear that citizens knew exactly where to go for help. Vindication, I think, of the decision some years ago to streamline dozens of Whitehall websites into gov.uk, a single authoritative up-to-date source of information. And further evidence, too, of the achievements of GDS in helping departments with their digital transformation during the decades since its launch as a center of excellence. And just to complete this round of, of, uh, uh, of tribute, if you like, to colleagues across government who've really done that magnificently in dealing with the digital demands of COVID, I'd like to mention the National Cyber Security Center, part of GCHQ, as during the pandemic, their workload also scaled up to counter a record number of cyber attacks by malicious actors in this country and abroad, looking to exploit the melee of COVID and any weaknesses in cybersecurity. Targets included not only the major money distributing departments like HMRC and DWP, but also NHS systems and even Nightingale hospitals. So we should be very grateful to the NCSC for throwing a protective cloak around our national infrastructure. And we can also celebrate that our democracy has not faltered during the pandemic. Cabinet meetings and EU exit negotiations have been hosted on, on, uh, on Zoom and other platforms. And of course, virtual sessions of parliament, landmark moments in history have passed off without a serious technical hitch or interruption. So that's some of the good news and some of the ways in which we've been able to respond very quickly and very innovatively to the digital demands of the virus. But there have been things which, which could have done, been done better and those are things which we really want to tackle now as part of the ongoing reform of our digital services. Let me pick out three things in particular. First of all, putting citizens at the center of services. They, not the government, should be the sun in this universe. Services should orbit around them, not the other way around. And it's, we know it's not like the private sector. Our, our fellow citizens, are not like clients they can't or customers they can't head off to a competitor citing poor customer service because there's nowhere else to get a passport or universal credit or other vital government services so our covenant with citizens demands we make the process as seamless and painless as possible and yet for all our progress in publishing information and signposting services it can often be unnecessarily confusing there are so many ways to sign on to so many different government services, same data to be entered time and again, such a waste of time, not a great experience. So in our new vision, members of the public will instead have a single sign on, an open sesame to any online central government service that grants simple, safe and secure access. And when they have to prove their identity, it should be easily done in a way that doesn't require them to put information in all over again. In time, it may also be possible to personalize services, updating users about changes that might affect them if they've, if they've expressed an interest in this. You might say there's nothing special about that as you scroll through advisory text messages about Tesco's Christmas delivery slots being open or the courier's left a parcel in your safe place or um, other interactions with private companies. But when it's government, people feel specially about that. So it's very important that one person's useful and innovative can be seen as somebody else's intrusive or even coercive. So we need to recognize that as we create a single sign-on, it's not so much that it's technically taxing, but more that we need to make sure we maintain the trust and confidence of our fellow citizens that their privacy is being respected. So our guiding principle is one of user control and informed consent. And this brings me to the second area of major improvement required. We need to get better at using and sharing trusted data and to overcome the barriers presented by legacy IT. Throughout the civil service, we still grapple with some 
old computers and old databases, and that makes it very difficult to be able to share data. From last year's data alone, we find out uh, that across 21 different departments, around half of the current government IT spend, that's about three billion pounds out of a total IT spend of about five billion, is dedicated to keeping the lights on activity on, some of which is using outdated legacy systems. We know that some of the systems are still incompatible. We know that much data is still held on old databases, microfiche, or even paper records. And that means it can't, it's disorganized, it can't be shared. So we only have a patchy picture of the information we hold, and that means it's very difficult then for citizens to get the type of fast and personalized services that they expect. When we look at our record in the UK, we can see that overall in digital, we've been doing a decent job. In fact, according to the OECD's flagship index, the UK is number two in the world behind South Korea overall for digital government, measuring countries against six different criteria. And we scored top marks for our government as a platform work and having a data-driven public sector. Second, for being open by default and third, for being user-driven. But for digital by design, we're in the sixth place, and our 11th place ranking for proactivity would place the square in the also-rans. And we don't want to be also-rans, we want to be leaders. We want your help to get, get here. Um, so to help us be the data, the, the pacemakers, as we look to shift from a model based on single specific online transactions, carried, carried across different departments and agencies across government, to a model based on single specific online transactions to a more efficient, less disjointed user experience. Our national data strategy is now out for consultation until December the 2nd as we gather evidence on its scope, ambition and proposals for an integrated data platform, for example, to help link up those lonely data sets or our overhaul of legacy IT. So please, please respond to that consultation or get in touch with, your, uh, with us with your ideas. And I think that your responses will feed into our third area of focus, which is making sure that we've got the right conditions and ecosystem for reform to be successful. And that requires leadership, organization, and system changes all to be lined up. Many of you will have seen that we've returned in the UK the responsibility for data, government data, back to the Cabinet Office and the Government Digital Service. DCMS will, fo will focus on data for the digital economy, whereas my department, the Cabinet Office, will focus on the government use of data. We're also making changes to strengthen the leadership to drive and deliver change. We're looking at the moment for a government chief digital officer, a permanent secretary level person who will be responsible for convening all the CDIOs across government with our shared agenda. We're appointing a, a chief executive officer, GDS, who will be in effect a chief product officer for government digital whose priority will be overseeing from the center the development and delivery of high quality digital tech and platforms for use by individual departments. And this new leadership structure will be able to draw on a new system of controls in which technical sign-off is tightly integrated with financial approval and scarce resources are directed to strategic priorities like the single login and cross-government data sharing. And we want this new structure to help us deliver on what we see as a once in a lifetime opportunity to improve the lives of many people and be a game-changing force for good. Expectations we know are running high, not only within government, within number 10, within the, um, the cabinet, among civil service leadership, or among the tens of thousands of people who we've been in touch with over the last few months to put together our plans, but also amongst the general public who've learned to really rely on government digital and data services, to rely on our ability to respond quickly and, and uh, sympathetically to their needs. We need to make sure that we make the changes we need to do to serve them well and not to let them down. Just to finish with a final thought in the second period of lockdown that we're experiencing in the UK, like in many other countries, and how, how we're responding to that in government. Far from being browbeaten by the virus, we are like the doctors who know so much more than they did in the spring about how to treat it now well-placed to tackle its effects on the public services. Our systems have been stretched and tested 
like never before, but not failed. Today, we're more determined than ever to deliver the ambitious changes that will strengthen the efficiency, effectiveness, and resilience of, our, of online government services. And as we pivot our efforts towards the new opportunities and challenges of mass testing and mass vaccination, we see again the extraordinary commitment and adaptability shown by our public, our public servants and how we need to continue to reinvent the delivery of public services in a digital era. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alex. That was such a brilliant overview and it's really good to end on that positive note. I think what's really good there is the concrete examples that you gave of how governments, in particular the UK government, have stepped up to the challenges of COVID and how that's driven some innovations in itself. And I mean, the one thing that um, struck me as a kind of UK citizen mm -hmm. during those daily briefings that we had for a long time yeah. and that have started again, although not so regularly at the moment, we saw for the first time ever that I can remember different professions side by side. So you saw medical officers, scientists alongside ministers. Um, and that was something that I think people really welcomed. It was something when we talk about civil service reform and a big part of this event is about bringing professions together, yeah. trying to break down silos across departments. So do you think there's learning that we can take forward from this period, but also from civil service reform in the past that will finally overcome some of those barriers about breaking down silos? That's so hard to achieve. Thanks very much, Siobhan. That's a great question. I think you, um, the short answer is yes. I think that COVID and indeed in the UK also EU exit has really accelerated our ability to work right across government and to join up not just between government departments but with um, important external public agencies, with local authorities, with devolved administrations and with people at the front line of services. And that's been you know, really a great feature of our response to um, the virus. Just to give you an example, I remember when we first identified that um, a particular cohort of people was going to be especially vulnerable to the, the, the virus around about um, 2 million people um, had exceptional vulnerability, mostly because of their age, in some cases, because of so-called comorbidities. So having identified that, which came from GP records, we then needed to provide a service for, for people locally to be able to identify, contact those people, and provide them with essential supplies, including food deliveries. And that required a coordination between not just the NHS and the Department of Health, but DEFA is the department responsible for food policy, the Ministry for Health and Local Government, working with local authorities, working with local resilience fora, which in each part of the country are the way that we coordinate local actors. Um, setting up this new uh, digital service, which was there available in a matter of, of days. So I think that is a great example of how this cross-system working is required in order to deliver really worthwhile public services. I think also there's been a bit of a change in, in public's attitude, attitudes towards government in our country, I'm sure others too, because people have seen that government is not just a, a kind of a political activity which they can watch about on television or hear, hear on the radio, but something which actually the quality of those government responses are, are literally matters of life and death. Yeah. And I guess picking up from that, one thing COVID has exposed is... Um, how the pandemic has affected different groups in society, yeah. how some groups are more vulnerable than others. And one of your many hats is the diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. um, uh, champion for yeah. the civil service. Yeah. And in a recent speech to civil servants, you talked about how important it was to try and make sure that civil services themselves are more representative of the public that they serve. Do you think that's really important in terms of driving forward innovation? Very much so. So I think, um... Uh, when we think about diversity and inclusion today, we don't only think of it as a moral or legal responsibility, we also think of it as a performance issue. And I think that's, and I'm sure that's true in, in other administrations around the world. And when you have exceptionally difficult challenges like this, it's all the more important to make sure that we're making the most of all the talents available, whatever people's backgrounds. And that, having, having agreed to work with us, we then make the best possible use of all of their talents. So, I think it's been a fantastic um, moment for, for seeing and recognizing the importance of um, our ability to include the entire workforce, to track talent from all different parts of the population. I think it's also, um, we've seen how the impacts of the virus are, are different, not only by age and comorbidities, but also have had different effects on different ethnic groups as well. 
and we published the as soon as we came um, came to it, Public Health England in the UK published the research there. Again, that's a good example of how it's wrong to assume that a single thing has identical effects on all different yeah. parts of the population. So um, that's another aspect I think where again taking a really sort of diverse and differentiated view would teach us to actually act differently in relation to different parts of our fellow um, population. Great. Alex, it would have been lovely to have you here for even longer. Um, it's remarkable with all the comings and goings that have been happening in uh, the UK at the moment that you actually managed to get here at all today. So thank you so much for the time that you gave us. Thank you. Um, couldn't have thought of a better opening keynote to set the scene for the next two days. So Great. Enjoy thank the rest so of the conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck with everything me. else. Bye, sure. Thanks thank a lot. You. Okay, well, Innovation 2020 would not be possible without the support of our fantastic knowledge partners, EY, Google Cloud, Workday, and Huawei. EY are the headline knowledge partners for this event, and we're particularly grateful for all of their support and their input. This is actually the second year that they've been supporting this event, and I think it's true to say that their role in fostering and enabling innovation in governments across the globe is very well respected. So it's my pleasure as the next stage to introduce a message from Julie Teagland, who is EY's Europe, Middle East, India and Africa managing partner and EY's global leader for Women Fast Forward. And I think we've got a video to play you now. Good morning. I'm Julie Teagland, EY's managing partner for Europe, Middle East, India and Africa. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Government Innovation Summit on behalf of EY, the lead knowledge partner for this event. We were due to gather in London for this summit back in March, but of course, since then, COVID-19 has turned our world upside down. In their responses to the pandemic, governments around the world have worked with great speed, agility, and innovation to protect lives and livelihoods. I'm representing an organization of nearly 300,000 people across 150 countries. We too have been working diligently to support our people during these difficult times and to minimize the disruption that the pandemic has brought to their personal and professional lives. Throughout, our priority has been the safety of our people, clients, and communities. In a matter of weeks, we had nearly 300,000 EY people working remotely so that they could help their clients maintain business continuity and build their resilience. EY people also created a wide range of pandemic related solutions and provided pro bono support to communities and governments. We remain committed to providing stable, high quality jobs Despite the disruption caused by COVID-19, this year EY welcomed more than 76,000 new colleagues and honored our long-standing commitment to 15,000 interns around the world. These efforts demonstrate our commitment to building long-term value for clients, people, and society. And they illustrate the strength of our culture, founded on our purpose, to build a better working world. I'm proud that EY has worked on more than 250 projects with government and health services across the globe to help deal with this pandemic. For example, we worked with the government of Chile to set up digital triage tools to screen patients prior to entry in the emergency rooms. We helped the Australian government agencies transitions employees to remote working so they could maintain service delivery. And we supported the Canadian government's supply of personal protective equipment for frontline services at a time when more than 60 countries halted exports of PPE. Some trends of the pre-COVID world have been accelerated, such as the use of digital communications and online provisions of goods and services. Others, like the growth of global tourism, have been reserved. We've worked with clients across all sectors to help them deal with the immediate disruption posed by this pandemic so they can continue to serve their people, their customers, and their communities. 
and we're working alongside them to plan for the future. This pandemic has given us a glimpse of a better future where the air in our cities is cleaner and perhaps even greener. Our communities will come together to support people and we all benefit from the connectivity that digital communication offers. But we don't underestimate the task ahead. People have lost jobs, children's education has been interrupted, and mental health has deteriorated. As we approach the task of economic and social reconstruction, we believe that the public and private sectors have an opportunity to shape the recovery in a way that makes economies more resilient and productive, that makes them greener and fairer. To achieve this, we believe that governments, financial institutions, and businesses should work together in six key areas. First, dealing with the aftermath of the pandemic to build the recovery. Priorities by stimulus revenue incentives to shift behavior. Fourthly, supporting global trade to drive growth and competitiveness. Fifth, focusing on jobs and skills to prepare people for the workplace of tomorrow. And last, but by far the least, driving innovation. Which brings us to the reason why we are talking to each other today. Looking back, some of the greatest innovations have emerged when governments and the private sector work together. The internet and the global positioning system, better known as GPS, are both examples of transformative technologies that were essentially the result of government funded innovation. The private sector helped apply these technologies in ways that have really changed how we live our lives. It's in the spirit of collaboration that we join with you today. On behalf of all the EY participants at this summit, we look forward to the discussions over the next two days. We will share, listen, and work with you together as we develop new ways to innovate, new ways to build a world that works better for people everywhere. I look forward to these two days, and I hope that the discussions will be productive for our governments and for our communities. So really good to hear from Julie there from EY. Building on the success of last year's event, we hope that the next two days will help all of you, civil servants from a range of professions and functions, and from countries all around the world, to promote and develop new approaches to policymaking and service delivery. First, considering your own profession's roles in cross-government innovation, and then by coming together to explore how civil servants of all disciplines can drive forward the innovation agenda. Innovation is a ground up process built on the ideas of staff across government and fostering it requires more than just warm words on culture change, or on failing fast, civil servants must identify the real world constraints on innovation and take real action to minimize these. To become more responsive and agile, civil services must adapt their processes, their systems, their cultures, so that staff have the space to innovate. Over the next two days, we'll explore how all of you can do this how you can help to create public sector organizations that work better for citizens, for staff, and for elected leaders alike. So let me just tell you a little bit about the program over the next two days. Today will comprise of online workshops where you will explore five topics around innovation. So broadly speaking, skills and tools, data sharing, new technologies, governance and finance, and leadership. We'll look at how you'd like to develop your own working methods, how to tackle the barriers to doing so, and how you in turn can help to clear the way forward for your colleagues from other disciplines and other departments. Each of those five topics will be served by several workshops. So this should enable us to gather the views of a range of professions and functions 
and each workshop will be chaired by a civil service leader. Tomorrow, those workshop chairs will join panel discussions in front of the wider audience, transmitting all of your views and exploring how the professions can work together to remove as many of those obstacles as possible for innovation to thrive. These panels should both identify the opportunities for innovation and generate practical ideas for creating a more inventive, agile and responsive civil service. So please, if there's one thing I could do, it's to encourage you to get fully involved with the discussions and to contribute your perspectives. Treat this as if it really is an in-face conference, as if you were there in the room. The more you engage, the better the outcomes will be. And on that note, a conference of this scale, Innovation 2020, is an ambitious event. It was always going to be a complex agenda, a complex structure, even when we were going to meet in person. So online, well, this is a new experience for all of us. And for many of you, I'm sure, attending as well. We have hundreds of civil servants attending from all around the world. So GGF, Global Government Forum, have worked hard to try and make the event as effective, as smooth, as joined up and enjoyable as possible. But we do thank you for your understanding if there are any technical glitches as we bring together all of you around the globe who are joining us for this event. When invited into a breakout group, which may happen today, please assist your fellow delegates, if at all possible, by keeping your camera on. People can find it much harder to speak to a group if they can't see people's faces. And in all of those breakout groups, the first task that you have to do will be to identify a person to, who can help facilitate the discussion, who can help make sure that you all get to speak your views and who can feed back to the chair. So we'll hope that you won't be shy in coming forward to volunteer to fulfill that role once today. As Alex needed to condense his speech, I'm sure many of you will understand there is so much going on in the UK at the moment, not just with Brexit, but other things going on here at the moment. So we do have a little bit of time now before you go into your first workshop. Those first workshops are due to start at 9.30. So take this opportunity to grab a coffee, get yourself ready, get comfortable, and then log into your workshop just before 9.30. I'll be seeing you over the next few days, especially the next two days, especially tomorrow in those panel discussions. And I hope you have a brilliant first day and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. Good morning.